Welcome to the third and closing video of this chapter. In the previous episode, we learned about the P controller. We have seen that it responds much better to load than the simple open loop control, but unfortunately, it always has a residual error. We can eliminate the residual error, so let's see what we have to do. We would need to complement the P part somehow, so that even at zero error, there is some actuating signal to balance the internal losses and the external load. However, the actuating signal should not change at steady state and zero error, because then this equilibrium would be upset. What if we added up all the previous mistakes? Let's look at an example. To keep things simple, let the P part, which is the value of KP, be equal to 1. Let's assume that our P controller produced an output of 70 RPM for a 100 RPM set point, so our residual error will be 30 RPM. Add another term to our controller, which will be the sum of the previous errors. Then the actuating signal will be produced. Let's do a thought experiment. In the steady state of our P controller, let's turn on the error sum tag. Before turning it on, the motor speed is set to 70 RPM with a set point of 100 RPM, so the error signal is 30 RPM, which gives an actuating signal U of 1 times 30 equals 30%. The moment when the summing block is switched on is called time step 0. In the following first step, the error signal will still be 30 RPM, so the error signal will also be 30 RPM, and thus our actuating signal will be 60%. This will cause the motor speed to increase, as the actuating signal was previously only 30%. In the next second time step, the motor speed is already 80 RPM, so the error signal is only 20 RPM, and the sum of the error signal is 30 plus 20 equals 50 RPM, the actuating signal is now 70%. In the table and figure, you can observe a continuation of the thought process. You can see that in step 11, the error signal has now dropped to zero and the actuating signal has stabilized. From these results, we can say that this summation method meets our expectations. It eliminates the residual error and reaches the equilibrium state. This is essentially our PI controller. We just need to add the constant multiplier KI to the sum of the error to set the weighting we want to give to this, in the previous thought experiment this multiplier was 1. The PI controller is the extension of the P-type controller with an I, which means integral type controller. Thus, the controller considers not only the error signal at the current time, but also the previous ones. This has the advantage that in steady state, the residual error generated by the P part can be eliminated. In the time quantized or discrete time case, at the nth time step, the equation of the PI controller is as follows. Where UN is the actuating signal issued in the nth step, KP is the gain of the P part, EN is the error signal at the nth step, KI is the gain of the integral part, EI is the error signal at the ith step, and delta TI is the time elapsed between the ith and the previous step. And for signals that are continuous in time, at a given time T, TH, the equation of the PI controller looks as follows. U of T is the actuating signal issued at time instant T. KP is the gain of the P part. E of T is the error signal at time instant T. KI is the gain of the integral tag. Tau is the integration auxiliary variable. E tau is the error signal at tau time. And D tau is an infinitesimally small elementary time step. There's no need to worry about the complex mathematical symbols and formulas. In practice, it will be much easier to implement the integrating part in the microcontroller program code. Import the lecture 19 PI controller and open the file main.c and scroll down to the run proportional integral controller function. The error signal is generated in the same way as for the P controller. The sum of the error signals is stored in the error int variable. It's simple to calculate each time the plus equal operator is used to add the current error multiplied by the time step, which is given in the PI time step macro to the previous sum. In our microcontrollers, time is measured in milliseconds in most cases, so it's useful to store PI time step in this way. In our microcontrollers, time is measured in milliseconds in most cases, so it's useful to store PI time step in this way. Since our formulas are true in SI units, we need to multiply the value by 1,000 to convert seconds to milliseconds. Finally, 
The actuating signal of the PI controller is assembled from the P and I parts and the PWM output is set accordingly. Now we have implemented our PI controller, let's try it out. Load the code into the development board, then hold down the top button. Then the set point will be a square wave that alternates between 40 and minus 40 RPM per second. The plotted diagram clearly shown that the motor will adjust exactly to the specified speed of plus 40 or minus 40 RPM without any residual error. It's good that the motor is set to the specified value without residual error. With P and PI controllers, it is possible that when changing the set point, the control signal, that is the speed of the motor, exceeds the set point. In control engineering, this is called overshoot. An example is shown in this graph. Controllers that have overshoot are generally faster, but overshoot can have several disadvantages depending on the actual process. For example, imagine a neurosurgeon robot is controlling the position of a scalpel attached to its robot arm. In this case, it would be highly detrimental if the scalpel position was adjusted by overshooting and cut deeper than necessary, paralyzing the patient for life. Of course, this was a bit of an extreme example, but in engineering practice, there are many cases where a small overshoot can have serious consequences. If you want to observe a controller with overshoot, all you have to do is stand in front of a mirror. Lean in close and close one eye. With your other eye, focus on your closed eye and then open it. While your eyes were closed, your pupils dilated under the influence of the darkness. When you opened them, the sudden brightness caused them to contract rapidly then dilate again slightly as they adjust it to the constant light. The diameter of your pupils changed in a similar way to the figure. The PI controller can also be tuned in three ways already described. To repeat, these are the heuristic tuning, model-based tuning and rule-based tuning. Now again, we use the Ziegler-Nichols rule-based tuning. In addition to the simple measurement, the additional advantage here is that we have the same measurement for P and PI, and even PID controllers, so we can get the values of the P and I terms in a single measurement. The previous measurement showed that the critical value of KP is 8.1, and the critical value of T is 0.28 seconds. Now we must use the formulae in row PI of the ziegler nichols table. The value of Kp is unchanged, and Ki is 4.2021 per second. We haven't talked much about units so far, but you may have noticed that the Ki parameter has a unit of 1 per second. It may seem strange at first, but the unit of the error integral is second, because we multiply the error sum by the elapsed time. Therefore, the i term overall becomes dimensionless, as we are multiplying 1 per second by second. We can see that the main.c file already has these values in the PI controller parameters, so the operation we tested earlier was already tuned. After a rule-based tuning, it is worth refining the parameters. This is most often done with heuristic tuning, which is not thought of as randomly adjusting the parameters, but as making small incremental or decremental changes by checking whether the controller's behavior has changed in the direction you want or not. Now let's take a look at what happens to the speed under external load in the usual way. Set the set point to 20 RPM by pressing right button once, then examine the display values carefully. The set point marked RA is 20, the controlled signal, the Y is 20, the error signal, that is E is 0, and the actuating signal marked U is around 40. Now load the motor shaft while watching the display. The set point has not changed, but neither the controlled signal nor the error signal has changed significantly. However, under load, the actuating signal increased from 40 to 47, sometimes 100. The controller already meets our original requirement, which said, in the example shown, we want to set the speed of a gear drive connected to an electric motor to a value, we specify using a microcontroller, with an unknown load on the drive shaft. You might think that this PI controller has everything you need, but there's one thing we haven't paid attention to, and that's the saturation. 
I mentioned earlier that the control variable cannot grow beyond all limits, nor can our process withstand any amount of control variable without damage. Saturation is the phenomenon when a signal can no longer increase or decrease due to an external or internal physical limit. For example, the fill factor of a PWM signal cannot be lower than 0% or higher than 100%. The motor controller cannot output a signal with a voltage higher than 5 volts when 5 volts is applied. Press the right button repeatedly to set a 60 RPM setpoint, wait 10 seconds, then press the stop button to set the setpoint to zero. The engine speed will almost immediately reset to zero. Perform the same experiment, but now set the setpoint to 200 RPM. You can see that during the 10 seconds, the actuating signal has increased to several thousandths of a second. Then, after setting the set point to zero, the motor speed remained around 80 RPM for many seconds and then suddenly started to decrease. But then very slowly, as we have seen it. This is due to saturation, as the engine shaft speed cannot go above 80 rpm. Because of this, the error signal at each moment was 120 at the set point of 200, which the summing operator kept adding to the I part. This is called the integral windup of the controller. When we set the set point to zero, we can see that the error signal became about minus 80. Due to the integrator, the actuating signal was thus reduced accordingly in each cycle, but it took many seconds for the motor speed to start decreasing due to the internal windup. The motor speed started to decrease when the actuating signal dropped below 100%, as this is the saturation value of the PWM fill factor. Anti windup methods were created to solve this problem. The simplest of these is presented here, where the point is simply to maximize the value of the I part. Open the controller point C file and scroll to the run proportional integral controller underscore aw function, which includes the anti windup method. The maximum value of the PWM signal that can be output is between 0% and 100%. The sign determines the direction of rotation. The controller output is calculated using the formula k int times error int, so we must limit it between minus 100 and plus 100. The value of error int must therefore be limited between minus 100 per k int and plus 100 per k int. In the main.c file, call this function instead of the traditional PI controller, load the code, and run the measurement again. We can see that with this very small addition, the regulator works much better and handles saturation properly. In this video, we got to know the PI controller, which in our measurements seemed to be the best solution for this speed control task. Thanks to the integrating or summing part, the engine speed reaches the set point accurately and without error, and with the anti windup addition, it can follow and maintain the reference signal in almost all conditions, of course, within the limits of the motor, its speed, torque, and power. We have seen that such a controller is not that complicated to implement in the code, and they only need to perform basic operations. The speed control implemented here is very similar to the cruise control system found in cars, which can maintain the speed set by the driver on a downhill or uphill, even in headwinds or tailwinds, as long as the engine power can overcome the load. However, it's important to note that the car's cruise control system is much more complex than this, and must also meet a number of safety requirements. In this chapter, we have learned about simple P and PI controllers through a practical example. We have seen the advantages and disadvantages of open loop control compared to closed loop control. And finally, we have made a quite good working speed controller. We also looked at an example program to see how we can implement the P and PI controllers themselves. However, we cannot ignore the fact that control engineering is a much more complex discipline than that. Here, we've only given a flavor to the subject itself, 
but we have deliberately left out continuous and discrete time control, linear and nonlinear systems, single and multi storage systems, time division, state spaces, poles and zeros, mathematical models, the notion of stability, Bode or Nyquist diagrams, system identification, simulation, or for example, state estimators and Kalman filters, model based control, to mention only the most general things. To understand them, you need a higher level of mathematical knowledge, but for those who are willing to learn, I strongly recommend you to read up on the concepts listed here and delve into the mysteries of control engineering. We wish you a pleasant exploration and a lot of fun. We hope that we have helped you get a basic understanding of the controllers and that you can use them in your projects in the future. In the following chapters, you will learn about the power consumption of the microcontrollers and the embedded operating systems. And in the final, 24th chapter, you will be reacquainted with control. Visit the website crystalclearelectronics2.eu, where you can download the written version of the curriculum, the example codes presented, and the mobile app. Also, follow our YouTube channel and the Crystal Clear Electronics Facebook page for the latest content. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for more videos. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.